In this video, I'm going to walk you through updates I've made to my room presence sensor and my randomized vacation lighting script, both of which I highlighted in videos last year. And we're going to cover how to use Jinja to make things easier. So if you're looking to write more advanced smart home logic in Home Assistant, stick around because we're about to automate some boring stuff. Welcome back to Slacker Labs. My name is Jeff. This video is going to be a little bit different than my other tutorial videos, mainly because I'm going to be discussing updates to videos I made last year. So this video is going to be more focused on the technical pieces and not so much on the context around those automations. But it will be a good opportunity for us to highlight some use cases for Jinja in our smart home logic. I'll leave links to the original videos in the description for reference, just in case you want to see the parts that I'm not covering here. And with that, let's just get technical. Room presence is one of those things I think might be critical to smart homes. And in my home, I use it to route my audible notifications to rooms that are occupied. But it's also one of those things that still isn't perfectly solved by an off-the-shelf solution. And instead of going the DIY hardware solution in my case, I built a template sensor that took some assumptions and motion sensors to determine which rooms were occupied. The biggest flaw I found with the first version of this sensor I built was the idea that if the theater TV was on, then the room presence sensor state would be theater. At the time, I thought this would be a good idea because if the theater TV was on, it meant that someone was in the theater for sure. What that logic didn't account for though was when people got up to get snacks. And I found the notification playing while the movie was playing was extremely disruptive, no matter how low I set the volume. So if someone was in another part of the house at the time that the audible notification was playing, even if the theater TV was on, routing it to that other room seemed like a better idea. So I came up with this. In this version, I still use the if-else statements as a decision tree, but reorder their importance. And I put some time conditions on some of the sensors. For example, if any of the echoes were triggered in the last 60 seconds, that tells me someone was in the room and 60 seconds seems like a pretty good threshold. This allows me to ensure that if Jarvis, aka Home Assistant, is responding to something triggered by a voice command on one of those echoes, the response goes to the echo that was used. To the end user, this means that the interaction will appear seamless, and as long as the same voice is used, they won't know if it was the echo or Home Assistant that responded. Hashtag user experience for the win. Anyway, to get that information, we need to figure out which echo was triggered so we can figure out if it was the one used in the last 60 seconds. And to do that, we need to do some timestamp math. So I used this Jinja here to get all of my current media players, then filter those results to the ones with the attributes last called equal to true. The last called attribute only exists for echoes and there should only be one. This attribute is part of the Hacks Amazon Media Player integration. So if you don't see this attribute for any of your Echo Media Players, you'll need that integration. Next, we grab the last updated timestamp of that entity. And to ensure that we only get one, we use first. But we want the local time, so we use the as local function. Now we need to subtract that time from now. And we want the results to be in seconds, so we add the dot seconds at the end. Be careful with the parentheses in this Jinja. For every parentheses you open, you're going to need to make sure that you close it. If not, Home Assistant is going to give you an error. And after we do the math, we store the results in a handy variable named last x called seconds. Then we test to see if our results are less than 60 seconds. And if it is, then we use the entity ID of our echo as our value of this sensor. Okay, now is a good time to point out that you're going to see a mix of entity IDs and room names in this setup. In my use case, these all get translated into media players in my audible notification process. So in this step, I use both of them. Okay, since this is an if else tree, if no echo meets the triggered in the last 60 seconds criteria, we move to motion sensors. For this, I built a group that has all of my motion sensors in it. So I use some Jinja to get all of the info for those motion sensors. First, we make sure that we have at least one motion sensor currently on. If there is at least one, then we create a sensor variable, and in it we store the last motion sensor that was turned on by using this Jinja here to expand the group once again. We filter the results to the entities currently on, 
and we sort them by the last change attribute, and grab the last one. This should be the last motion sensor to be turned on. That means as they switch back off, they'll drop out of our list. Then I check to make sure audible notifications are off, because if the audible notifications are off, then I want the notifications to play either in the master bedroom or the kitchen, no matter what room people are in. This is to help control where the notifications play in times when somebody might be sleeping. If audible notifications is on, then we simply translate the current sensor into a room. I did this because in some rooms I have more than one sensor. And I also wanted to be able to leverage the natural cooldown in those sensors. So as long as the motion sensor is on, that's where the audio will play. But that also means that if someone enters a room and then doesn't move much, I need a solution to ensure that the last location to have activity is the value of this room present sensor. I solved that part as a separate automation, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, if no echoes are triggered and no motion sensors are on, then we look at the theater TV. If it's on, then we use the theater as the state of the room present sensor. The hope here is that if someone is outside of the theater, then that's where the audible notifications are going to play. And it's the last option in this decision tree because it is disruptive to the movie or whatever's going on in the theater. So we want to use the other options first. But then of course, if none of that is true, we want to just use the last known state since the assumption is the room with movement last must be where people are hanging out. This is where we get into solving that issue with entering a room and then not moving enough to keep triggering a sensor. I had originally just had this sensor referring to itself, but in Home Assistant, sensors will eventually clear since they're meant to show the most recent update. So in order to keep the last known update, I use an MQTT topic and an automation. You could just as easily use a helper to store the value of the sensor each time it updates. But in order to handle this piece, I just use an automation that triggers on any update to the room present sensor and stores the last value in my helper, or in this case, to my MQTT topic. Then as a last option in my room present sensor, I just grab the value that is stored there. And that's it for this one. After the updates to this sensor, this seems to be working more reliably. And the interactions with Jarvis are completely seamless. If you want to know more about my thought process around this room present sensor, hit up that link in the description to the original video. Back in 2021, I came up with a solution for randomized lighting that could be used to simulate human presence when we went on vacation. This was an attempt to take something that people were solving with third-party integrations and other add-ons and build a solution using completely built-in Home Assistant tools and integrations. And it worked, but it was very basic. And perhaps the result wasn't all that realistic. Since then, I've come up with a better way and I think it's simpler. Since this automation leveraged the repeating action, I used a script to do the main part of this process. So you'll need some way to kick it off, like an automation. Since I'm focusing on the script for this update, I'm going to leave that part off. But you can see how I did that in the video I linked in the description. Again, the whole purpose of this script is to randomize the turning on and off of lights to simulate human presence. The original version just turned on one light and then after a delay, turned that light off again which is not how humans typically operate, at least not in this house. We tend to turn on multiple lights as we move through the house and then turn them off later. So to simulate that, we added a bit more logic. We start with the same repeat action to keep this script repeating until the sun is above the horizon. I think this state condition works better than watching for after sunrise, or at least in my experience, works a little more consistently. So if you're having issues with automations triggering at the right time around sunset or sunrise, try this state. So as long as the sun is below the horizon, this should repeat. My script also includes a notification to my phone so that I know that this randomized script is running, but you could leave that off if you don't want it. The previous version of this script required an additional helper, but I've done away with that in favor of just doing it all with Jinja. No point in storing something if we can just get it in real time. Plus, I think that the randomized effect works better. So here, we just need a group that contains the lights and switches we want to randomly turn on and off. For the first action, we simply call the Home Assistant Turn On service. We use this service because our group could contain switch or light entities. For the entity ID we want to turn on with this service, we're going to use some Jinja. 
Because this service expects entity ID to be a string, we need to wrap all of this in quotes. Okay, let's break this down. Here, we use the expand function to grab all the details about the entities in our group vacation lights. With Jinja, we can use pipe to daisy chain more operations, with each one acting on the results of the one before it. So next, we filter the list of entities to just those that are off, so we can use the select attribute function to identify all of the entities in that group. Next, we discard any of the unneeded information and just get the entity IDs using this map function. Then we put them in a list, which is just a Python way of creating a comma delimited string. Then we use random to grab just one of the entity IDs from that list. Next, we delay for a random number of minutes. Here, this is set between one and three minutes, but you can make this anything you wanted. Just remember that this will be the delay between this action and the next. For the next action, we want to randomly choose between Home Assistant Turn On and Turn Off. Then based on that choice, we either get a list of devices that are currently off that we will turn on, or a list of the group devices that are on that we want to turn off. Again, we use the same Jinja as before, but depending on what service we randomly chose, we get a list of entities with states on or states off. This Jinja will look familiar. We expand the group, we filter it to the state we want, we get the entity ID, then we pick one of the choices at random. This means we could randomly be turning on more lights before we turn off some of the lights, instead of just turning one on and then turning it off again. This also means that the light we turn on in the previous step may not be the one that we turn off in this step. Again, I think that makes this a little more realistic. That's all I wanted to cover in this video. And I hope it gave you some ideas on how you can make your automations and scripts a little smarter. If you want to support Slacker Labs and our mission to help you automate the boring stuff, you can find a link in the description of this video to the official Slacker Labs t-shirt store, where you can get one of the shirts I wear in these videos printed on demand specifically for you. You can also let me know that you found value in this video by hitting that like button. And if you get a chance, let me know in the comments what kind of cool scripts and automations you're building in your smart home. If you haven't subscribed already, consider subscribing to my channel for more smart home content like this. And as always, thanks for taking time out of your home automation projects to watch mine. Until next time, go automate the boring stuff.